Action. <laughs> so we're in the process of cellular respiration. This is a process done by all cells. to transfer energy into a usable form. So energy comes in all of these different forms. We've got energy coming from the sun, we've got energy from chemical reactions, and we need it in a form usable by the cell. And the form that's usable by the cell is really ATP. So right now in cellular respiration, we're moving on to stage two, Stage three, the oxidation of pyruvate and the Krebs cycle. And so we want to take a second and just think, where did we come from? So we just came from glycolysis, which is literally the splitting of sugar. This is where we went from a six carbon sugar to two, three carbon sugars. And so you should be able to kind of make a list of the who's. The who's include things like glucose, phosphofructokinase, using ATP producing ATP, using NAD plus to take the electron to get reduced to make NADH, you should be able to kind of make that list and talk about who, what molecules are involved, what's happening, when does this happen, where does this happen, but we do want to go ahead and mention it's happening in the cytoplasm. And this is important as a frame of reference because we're going to move on from here. And this is actually going to be when we're going to start moving into the mitochondria. So all cells were able to do glycolysis, so we do kind of want to keep that in mind. All cells are performing glycolysis in their cytoplasm, and now we're going to kind of take it a little bit further. Um, so the next step could be a little bit of anaerobic fermentation. And so what we have here is kind of just a different diagram that shows you what would happen to pyruvate. So they all start with pyruvate. So what is the fate of pyruvate? We could send it through lactic acid fermentation. We could send it through alcoholic fermentation. But we're going to focus right now on aerobic oxidation. So really being under, able to understand what does oxidation mean. So you can do the cheat and do oil rig, or you can know that oxidation and reduction come together as redox, and that reduction is gaining an electron, and this is always paired with oxidation, which is the loss of an electron. Electrons matter, energy neither created nor destroyed. So if something is losing an electron, something else is gaining the electron. These are always paired reactions. So if I'm going to oxidize pyruvate, something else has to be getting reduced. And so we're going to kind of see that a little bit here. Before we go on to look at the actual chemical reactions that will happen, we do want to remind ourselves a little bit about the structure of the mitochondria because we're getting ready to move into the mitochondria. The oxidation of pyruvate will actually move us into the mitochondria. So the mitochondria, of course, we want to think a little bit about the endosymbiont theory. We want to keep in mind where the mitochondria came from, the theory that it could have once been its own little freestanding cell, little prokaryotic cell. At this point, and so of course we keep in mind that it does have its own DNA, it does have its own enzymes. This is in all eukaryotic cells. So this will be in plants. This will be in animals. This will be in protists. This will be in fungi. All eukaryotic cells have this organelle. And they don't just have one. They have many, hundreds, thousands sometimes depending on the function of the cell. So we do want to look a little bit about the structure and why that the structure allows it to do its job. The inner and the outer membrane are actually part of this endosymbiont theory. So we do want to notice there's an outer membrane, there's an inner membrane. So we kind of have two distinct compartments. We have the intermembrane space. So this is a compartment. And we 
have the matrix, and this is a compartment. So I must think of like one of those little lunchable things. And I've got all these different compartments, and we know the advantage of compartments is that we can do different things in different areas. Keep in mind this could be any type of cell. This is showing an animal cell, but it could be any type of eukaryotic cell. What we're going to see is that some of our reactions are going to happen in the intermembrane space, and some are going to happen in the matrix. So we just want to know these terms so that when we say it happens in the matrix, we know exactly where we're talking. So, the oxidation of pyruvate. But I like to call it the oxidation and decarboxylation of pyruvate. Because what we're going to be doing is we're going to be removing electrons and removing a carbon. So pyruvate is a three carbon molecule. Notice we're in the cytosol, which is another term for cytoplasm. And what we see is that we actually have its own transport protein embedded in the outer membrane of the mitochondria. So we could label this OM for outer membrane. So we have a protein embedded in the outer membrane. We're going to move pyruvate into the mitochondrion. This is singular, mitochondria is plural. And when we do that, we're actually going to decarboxylate or remove a carbon. One little quick note here is that we must have oxygen to do this step. So they actually haven't quite figured out, does oxygen bind to that transport protein? Why is it that oxygen is necessary? But research has shown that pyruvate will not enter the mitochondria unless oxygen is present. So oxygen has to be present. We move a three carbon in, and immediately a CO2 is taken off. You don't need to know the name of the enzyme. Of course, it'd be catalyzed by an enzyme. But what we do notice, and you can kind of see the CO2 that gets taken off right here. What we do notice is that it's actually going to be attached to a coenzyme. And we'll talk about this in a second. But here's a really good step to remember. Anytime we remove CO2, we're also going to remove electrons. So this step, the oxidation and decarboxylation, is we see that we remove a carbon and we remove some electrons as well. So this is a good title to remember for this section. So we, at this point, have gone from a three carbon to a two carbon. Off has come a CO2, and off has come one NADH. Now we have to pause for a second and remember that we actually started this process with a six carbon. We broke it into two, three carbons. So really, all of this is happening times two for every glucose. So we're going to have to kind of keep checking ourselves and reminding ourselves. If I put one glucose in, I will have actually released, at this point, two CO2s and gained two more NADHs. And so a good rule of thumb is to kind of see if you can keep a running tally. Of how many NADHs do I have now? How many have I gotten total? We're going to talk a little bit about this coenzyme A for a second. This two carbon molecule is pretty unstable. So we attach the two carbon molecule to this coenzyme and it's actually going to deliver it to the Krebs. So all the coenzyme and acetyl CoA are is a way to deliver the two carbon to the Krebs cycle. It doesn't really add anything. It doesn't really change the molecule. It's really just there to help deliver the two carbon molecule to the Krebs cycle. So glycolysis mainly splits the sugar, takes some electrons,
turns off get some ATP. Oxidation of pyruvate and decarboxylation. I'm getting some NADH, I'm getting some CO2. Notice no ATP. Didn't get any energy from this step, but we did get the sugar inside of the mitochondria. So that's when we go into the Krebs cycle next. And there are really three things that are going to be happening here. We're going to incorporate our two carbon into something bigger. We're going to decarboxylate our two carbon. And we're going to do some substrate level phosphorylation. So we're going to kind of talk about what is really going on here. Let's just take a quick overview of what's happening in the Krebs cycle. So our acetyl-CoA is delivering a two-carbon molecule. And then the coenzyme A gets released. And so that's why we see this CoA SH being released again. It goes back to do its job again. But what is it delivering the two-carbon to? It's delivering it to a four-carbon oxaloacetate. And this is one of the names that we need to know. Oxaloacetate is a four carbon intermediate. All it really is is like another little delivery vehicle. This little two carbon is really unstable. So we keep attaching it onto other things so that we can nitpick the electrons off. And so we attach our two carbon to a four carbon and all of a sudden, strangely enough, we're back at a six. And we do need to know this name, citrate. So those are really going to be the only two names you need to know out of the Krebs cycle. So I've been slowly pulling electrons and carbons off. I've reached this very unstable two-carbon molecule, so I put it onto something else so I can really carefully pull the electrons and the carbons off slowly. So my two-carbon got added to a four, and now I'm at a six. And you're going to see all these other things happening, and all that we're really going to focus on is electron carriers and ATP. So I'm going to remove a carbon and remove an electron at the same time. Every time I remove a carbon, I remove electrons as well. And that's kind of a cheat way. In the oxidation of pyruvate, I released a carbon, I got electrons also. Again, I release a carbon, I release some electrons. I get some ATP. I actually get a new electron carrier called FADH2. And this is the only place that FADH is produced. And you do actually want to know the oxidized form as well. The oxidized form here does not show, is not charged. NAD plus is this ion. And so it's pretty easy for us to tell which is the oxidized and which is the reduced form because one was positive. Here we don't have that positive. We just have the FADH2. So we do kind of need to know which one is the oxidized, which one is the reduced this would be the oxidized, this would be the reduced form. And then we actually make some more NADH. So let's take another second and look at what's actually happening here. We are delivering a two carbon molecule, slowly stripping off some carbons. Actually notice the pink and the blue that show up. The carbon we put in is actually not the carbons that are released off. So it's a very interesting little cycle that kind of requires itself to keep going over and over again. Deliver a two carbon, put it on a four, get a six. Remove one carbon and some electrons. Remove another carbon and some electrons. Get some ATP. Remove more electrons and I'm back to oxaloacetate and that's why it's called a cycle. Thank you.